Hi, everybody. This is Holland Harry Gocher calling from New Orleans, Louisiana. This is Ride by Day, Rent by Night, presented by Vintage Jet Ski. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to Ride by Day, Wrench by Night with me, Cam Wise. We are back with the highly anticipated part two of our interview with Hall and Harry Gocha. In the last episode, we started our journey with Harry's stepdad, Bill, introducing him to jet skiing. Together, they went from enjoying their family holiday in Lake Mead to Harry ripping it up on the race circuit. In 1986, Harry was spotted by Ed Lezinski from l and Engineering and his pro career was born. In this episode, we begin with Harry's race in Australia that left him with a pretty serious injury, and his reaction to the nurses cutting off his favourite jet pilot wetsuit will have you in stitches. Then, in 1991, Harry moved from r and Jet Tech to West Coast Performance, but he only spent one year there before moving back, and you'll never guess the reason why. You'll also hear more about what he considers his biggest achievement, which might not be what you'd expect, as well as the season where nothing went right. As always, Harry tells it like it is. So get ready to have a good laugh and I hope you enjoy the rest of our trip down memory lane. Okay, so the end of the stripe here was 89. And God, I did so well. And I had an R&R's, r and had my back and we did so well that that off season, I was just a complete beast. Now, Harry Gocher has never liked the gym. I'm an outside guy. When I train, I like to ride bikes, rollerblade. Well, I happened to date. I, I picked up this, on a female bodybuilder that <laughs> off season. Yeah. And her name was Jennifer. And she got me in the gym, put me on a vitamin program. And my Lord, I bulked up big, bigger than I'd <laughs> ever been. I was in the best. Dude, I was, but I was in the best shape of my life. Yeah. Going into that 90 season. So, before the 90 season happened, I went to Australia to defend my championship. Of course, yeah. So, look, I won the year before. I went to defend my championship. Okay. I had full R&R support to go to Australia. They sent my super stock motor. They sent my modified motor. And I rode for South Coast. I know the man's name's Grant Kramer. He's okay. still good friends with Matt Manning out of Melbourne. And he put, a, he put the, the skis together with all the motors. And we went to Mildura, Australia. I was told it's right behind Mel Gibson's ranch. At least it was back then. It was just a little, a little warm-up race. Okay? Yeah. Now, super stock and modified, for whatever reason... They ran three motos, three font, three motos of each. That's six in one day. Wow, must be knackered. I want all six. The mo the motors were awesome. I was in great shape, tip top, and just smoked. Just left everybody in the dust. It was a warm up race, so it's all good. Smoked it all. Well, here comes the girl. There's always a girl involved. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kelly Cummings, I had fallen head over heels for the girl the year before, and she was at the race. So I won everything, and I have nothing to prove, and just sitting there and can't wait to go out and hang out with Kelly after the race and think about drinking beer and having a steak or whatever. And pro freestyle to the line, pro freestyle, last show, pro freestyle. And I always picked up on this saying I got this from Jeff Jacobs because Jeff's a hardcore racer. Hmm. Jeff could do every trick out there, but Jeff just didn't need to. Sure, you just stuck to the racing. Jeff used to always say, tricks are for kids. <laughs> yeah. Ha ha. Well, I told you, I said, Kelly, tricks are for kids. She said, oh, baby, for me. <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, shit. Here you go. I said, all right, give me my mod. And I went out there after that. I did my spins and spins and jumps and flips and here you go I have my signature finale is a backwards tailspin dismount jump in the air on a flip go into the water on your head it's only the water what does it matter no big deal i was showing off for the girl i got too close to the land i got too close to shore i jumped in 
I went in head first, hit my head on the ocean at maybe about 30 miles an hour. Oh, man. What happened? I didn't lose consciousness, but I'm laying in like two feet of water, and my eyes are as big as silver dollars, and I knew something happened, guys, right? And, of course, I didn't know the severity, and I'm laying in the water, and I just, I just see white water, legs, you know, coming at me. And the first person there was Larry Rippenkroger because he saw how bad it was. I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. And man, he had, he grabbed my hand and just about squeezed it off. He said, coach, coach, are you okay? And I, I go, I, I think I fucked up this time, Rip. And I could still stand. So I stood up, but it's like my, my shoulders and my head, they were, they were tight. Something, something felt tight, you know? So there was a bunch of people on the shore and they just thought it was part of that, <sighs> you know, because it was my finale trick. And boy, they're clapping and jumping and yeah, I put up like know. a little hand, you know, I'm like, uh -uh. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, cool. And I just walked straight through them. I said, there's got to be a paramedic here. I went to the paramedic and they said, how's it going? I said, man, I hit my head. They're like, well... What does it feel like? Does it feel like pins and needles? I said, that's exactly what it feels like. They said, we're taking you to the hospital. And I said, I ain't going to the hospital. I'm fine. And I took my neck and I turned it left to right to show them I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. And I passed out. I passed oh. out. That was it. <laughs> they yanked me out and uh, they took me to a hospital. And uh, I still got my race suit on. And I remember the jet pilot suit. It had my name, Paul and H. Harry Gocher, laser printed. It was a badass wetsuit, right? Yeah. And they take the they take the X rays. Okay, they take the X rays, and I'm waiting. I'm in no pain, and I'm just sitting there like, okay, when do I leave? And the guy comes out of the X ray and he starts cutting my jet pilot off. Oh, I know. How bad is that? I've had crashes as well in different motorsports and and cycling, and they cut all your clothes off, and then you're like, damn it. I don't have my awesome bloody kit that I've spent so much money on all my sponsors. And yeah, that was one of the, <laughs> the most annoying parts to it. So I, I know how you feel. Yeah. So I felt the same way, Cam. So I'm like, Hey man, what are you doing? Cause mate, you have a broken neck. <laughs> uh Oh, Houston, we got a problem. So you basically couldn't fly home. Is that right? You've got to stay in Australia. Right. Exactly. So, uh, they had to drive in the automobiles very gingerly. Uh, I was in a, uh, I wasn't, thank God, I wasn't in a halo. Mm. Oh, I got to back up. They, the doctor, when I started complaining about him cutting my wetsuit off, I had a fracture of the C7 vertebrae, a fracture. And I was bitching, don't cut my blank, blank, blank off. I got a race and he says, Mike, do you know what a millimeter is? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, that's how close you were to being in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Far out. That puts it in perspective. Oh, man. It was my first awakening with God. Mm. Because if you don't come out of that with some, with some grace, boy, there, there's something wrong with you. So they got me back to Melbourne, Grant Kramer and his wife, Lisa. I believe his name is Lisa. Uh, actually, I'm certain of it. Uh, like I'd said before, um, thank God I wasn't in a halo. I was just in a neck restraint. You know, it was it was metal. It was pretty gnarly. So we went back to Melbourne, and they drove very gingerly <clears throat> in the car to get me there. And I, I felt fine, but I knew I had to be stabilized, and I couldn't fly, which absolutely crushed my mom. Mm. Uh, she wanted to fly out here and me fly home. So <clears throat> long story short, once we got back to Melbourne that Monday, Tuesday, you know, Grant and Lisa – they had a jet ski business to run. They had, they had to go to work. Yeah. So there I was, you know, by myself. And um, I really didn't need much, you know, maybe just somebody to, to make me a ham sandwich, which I'm pretty stubborn. So I'm like, I don't need anything. Well, Matt, Matt Manning wasn't taking no for an answer. And, and this guy was an apprentice, an apprentice carpenter at the time, just learning a carpenter trade. And he would show up. He just showed up. 
you know, every day about noon and he would, he would make me ham and cheese sandwiches. And there, I can see him right now. He's got his work boots on. He's covered in sawdust. And, you know, the guy took his breaks. What a good black. What a good dude, you know? And, and, yeah. and that was the beginning of a, a lifelong friendship with Matt. So once I was able to fly home, I went ahead and went home and, uh, mom and bill you know took care of me well um like i say my upper body needed to be stabilized you know through my neck and this this brace came all the way down to to my stomach but that i was still this this was off season so i was still training there was nothing wrong with my cardio my legs my arms so i was lifting weights uh i was on a stationary bike like back in the day before peloton you know, of course, there was, you know, you know, you know, we rode, I rode cycle bikes, you know, for training. So I put the stationary bike on it. And there's even a, there was even a picture in the jet ski magazine that came to my house. I put a picture of Jeff, taped it to the wall. Oh, wow. And I put it right in front of my bike. Yeah, it's a true story. It's Rocky style. In one of the magazines. Yeah, it's in my portfolio. Now I've got a full brace on and I can't do nothing, but I, but I can train. I can. I can bend, I can get my legs. And so I went ahead and trained and prepared for the season the best I could. I went way too, I mean, I, I could ride and, and my neck healed guys, my neck healed fine. But the way I had to pivot on my lower back through the neck brace, it, it, it really screwed up my spine and my lower back. Mm. And we went into that next season, the 90 season, uh, I was still with R&R. And I was in more pain than I've ever, than I've ever been in my life, my lower back and, you know, jumping, jumping waves and, and, and landing with all that compression and, and jet skiing just is, is hard on your lower back period. Mm. And, and I just did terrible. I, I, I think I, no, I know I still ended up with a number five plate, but at the end of that season, I was at Lake Mead. And you know, it, the sport was big. Everybody was out there. And we just called him Dr. Dan. I didn't know what kind of doctor he was. You know, he had a jet ski. And he said, man, Harry, you look like you're hurting, dude. And I'm like, oh, Dan, man. He goes, come here. And he was a chiropractor. All right. And he said, let me, he said, let me, let me fill you up. And he's like, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, oh, wow. He said, you are way out of whack. He said, yeah. I want you in my office tomorrow morning. This guy saved, Dr. Dan Milam saved my career. There's no doubt about it. What a legend. So by the time he cracked me up, we got back competitive again. Oh, on, on the physical side, I was, I was back in action. Man, I remember being busted up so many times through snowboarding and jet skiing, walking into his office. I couldn't even walk. I was, I was crooked as a, as, a, as a tree limb. And when I walked back out, I was straight, you know, straight as an arrow. So a lot of props to Dr. Dan for that. Yeah, yeah. Are you still with R and R at that time? R and R Jet Tech? Yeah, we were still with R and R now. Now, yeah, I came back with R and R. Um, so fast forward then R took a hit and um the business kinda went down. That's kinda all I want to say about that. Mm. And now we're going into the ninety one season. Now, that's when David Gordon was riding the number three boat for West Coast and Bob Zantos. And they had a, they had a you know, pretty good season. Um, West Coast was all in. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted to beat PJS, and Bob had the money and the resources to do it. So he put a lot of money into David, and then David just, he up and retired because David always wanted to be a police officer. Yeah, I think he's doing that now, actually. Oh, I'm sure he's with I. Yeah, because he's, he's hardcore. Um, I got to say something funny about David. A lot of people, David's had a nutrition regimen, like nutrition back in the day. It's like, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, not only did he not come out clubbing with this, this dude actually had his weighed his food in Ziploc bags. He was so serious about his fitness. Okay. Yeah. So once David retired, Bob had the van and he wanted to be competitive and keep going. But David just retired. And me and R and R split the sheets. Right. So that's where West Coast and I got together. Now, to put this delicately, I was not the one Bob wanted. Okay, I I wasn't. I didn't. 
a little bit on the wild side, competitive guy. But I really wasn't the guy he wanted, but I was the only guy. Did he have his heart set on someone that he couldn't have or was it just not? Yeah, you? he probably wanted, he probably wanted Jeff. Yeah. You know, he, well, who didn't want Jeff, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and now that I look back on it, Victor would have been a really, really great match at that point. But Victor was in bed with Butches and there was nobody available. So, so it was Bob and I, and we had the boats built uh, by Rec World, uh, Dave Newman, who worked his butt off. He's a great engine builder. And to make the record clear, Bob did everything he was supposed to do. He, per contract, he paid me what he was to do. The box van was awesome. The gas was taken care of. For the first time, my entry fees, my hotels were taken care of. And, and he really did his part. And, and Dave did the best he could. But we just weren't competitive. Why do you think that was? Was it the engines or just? Well, I don't know how many times I got to say it. We were trying to beat Jeff and nobody could. I mean, it's obviously a combination of a few things. So It's a combination. I mean, we couldn't beat him to the first turn. Not many people could. And then especially when he got in front, guys, it was over with. Yeah. I was just going to say that all these companies were, were pushing different engine specs and, and there was always something new coming out. And I'm, I know a few people, including myself, were always interested in, in the innovations. And one of them was, I'm not sure if it was just a rec thing, like a recreational um, sales point, but that dual ignition system. It was called it was called the dual spark. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Now the reason that Bob invented it was because that when the jet skis went to total loss ignitions, they they weren't refined. Like once we got MSD involved in our industry, MSD is doing ignitions for almost a hundred years, mm. man, with NASCAR. So they had it worked out. You know, once MSD came in, we didn't have any problem. Okay, but before MSD came. We had problems. So the first thing that would go out would be the coil. Yeah. Now, once again, I'm not all that mechanical, but I know the coil is way underneath the flywheel, and it's a, it's a lot of work to get to it. So we, there were coils going out left and right. Yeah. And when a coil went out, you were done. You were done for the weekend. You were done for points. You were done, period. So Bob had this idea to come up with a dual coil to where you just – flick the switch, and it would jump to another coil. Wow, that's actually pretty smart. So almost planning that you're going to fail it and then just flick to the other one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> planning planning that it's going to fail, you have a backup plan. So it was great thinking. It was a great business move. And, man, the way it looked was awesome. It was like this big, but it was bulky. You know, it was on the front of the cylinder, Yeah, and it was heavy. And I can't think of one time that we needed it. <laughs> so you never actually put it into practice? Uh, we never put it into practice. I mean, uh, I'm not a history buff, but I can. I wouldn't think that that sucker lasted but a couple seasons, if that. But great idea. Yeah. You know, great idea on that, on that behalf. Um, so we're done with West Coast, and I'm going back to R&R. Right. Is that just because it wasn't working or what was the go there? With West Coast? Yeah. Yeah. So Bob and I never saw eye to eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, this is my interview, so I'm just going to call it the way it is. It's your interview. Absolutely. Uh, so one, you had asked me about the world finals and how popular it was and the girls, and that was just awesome. But I'm going to tell you right now, at 19 years old, I fell in love with Tina, Tina Martinez. And we married. We were together for 13 years. That was the love of my life. Now, Tina was a pro woman's racer also. Well, Bob had a big problem with Tina. He don't want her staying in West Coast hotels. He don't want her under the tent. And he made that point blank. I told him, Bob, you can kiss my ass. That's my woman. She's going to be with me. Yeah. So that's that. So... Not only were we not competitive, Bob and I didn't see eye to eye. He told me about my woman. I told me and kissed my ass. Pretty much the writings on the wall. <laughs> that that's just that's just the truth of it. Now, so I go back to R and R in '92. Now, at this point in the sport, 
the X2s were already quite prevalent. Mm. Now, the X2 had the 650 motor. We raced the 550. Well, R&R had a, a mechanic slash rider by the name of Tim Judge. Tim is a badass. Yeah. He was a professional BMX. He, oh, dude, I guarantee you right now, Tim would probably beat everybody at anything. Uh, he was a, prof I'm telling you, man, I know Tim Judge. He's a very serious person about his fitness and his life. So at any rate, he was his own mechanic, and he was just about the champion, if I remember right, of the X2 class. So long story short, he had the 650 dialed in, okay? He had that motor dialed. Well, when I went back to R&R, &R, we started the season on the 550, for a couple of couple races on the West Coast, it would start. Then we would head east and continue our national circuit. When we got back to R&R, &R, the 650s got legalized. And Tim took this technology of the 650s like, wait, I, I know this motor. I know the impellers already. Let's just put this thing in a stand-up and put Harry on it. Oh, <laughs> oh. Match, good match. Buddy, look. We was in Florida. He tunes it up, and we do a practice hole shot, a practice start. I get on this thing, pew, and I honestly say to myself, I say, so this is what Jeff has felt like. <laughs> I, I did. I said, I'm actually going to win. I going into an event, knowing or having a gut feeling, I'm confident, I'm going to be to that first turn first. So just focus on the turns. Don't get lost. Get a, hey, getting lost on a, on a buoy track when you're ahead happens a lot. Yeah, I bet. You really got to study it, man. You know, and you look like a fool. Trust me, I know I've done it many times. When you whole shot a race, you're not used to being in front. You're like, oh, shit. After five or six turns, like, where the hell am I going? <laughs> yeah, you're not following the leader. <laughs> Yeah, and they're like, oh, he went that way, you know. So so we had so I had this 650. That and Jeff was still on a 550, but that thing was almost still as fast as mine. But bottom line was that was the best year of my life competitively because I finally had I finally had equipment that was as good, if not eh, I don't want to say better than Jeff's, but look, it took a modified 650 to compete with his board out 550, bro. That's how that's how fast that thing was. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing because he's on that very nimble 550 and you're, you know, people are upgrading to the 650s and the 750s with a bit more of a stable hull, or at least they were bigger. So it's, again, pretty impressive what he did. They were. It? Yeah. So I had the best. Uh, so I made the number three plate, which is as high as in the, in the national as, you know, Harry's ever got. Okay. Um, and that was a great accomplishment for me because it, it was always Jeff at top, at the lead, and we'll get into Jeff here shortly, Victor and Chris Fischetti. And Fischetti and Victor would swap out two and three and three and two, but I never broke into that three. But that year I did make that number three. That's awesome. It's a good achievement. It's my biggest one. Now, I've got Australian championships and – London champion championships all over, but the big one was the national championships. See, a guy can go into the world finals and have a great, a great day. Okay. And you win the pro mod overall, you're the world champion. Now you deserve that. Cause you, here I go again. You beat Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. But the national, that's when it's like a, like a NASCAR series. You, you got to win overall through 14, 15 races. So that's, that's just, it just holds more water. It's a lot more work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot more work, uh, stamina for the equipment to spawn. It's just, it takes you know, two, three months to do that. Yeah. So we're going to end this on my end is that next season was 92, I believe, 92. Yeah, 90, no, 93. I go in with 650s that are modded. I get the black paint jobs that I want. Jet Pilot gave me a box van as part of my contract. I had the thing custom painted 
with American flags. I had a protract trailer. Everything was fluid, chrome rims. I had it all. Pretty pimp. The bitch looked so good. <laughs> I looked good. I had the best plate, the number three. The 10, <laughs> the head. <laughs> it was everything. Yeah. And nothing went right. I mean, when I say nothing went right, nothing went right. <sighs> the skis broke all the time. Yeah. What was the main thing that failed? Was it Was it just they exploded or what was what was the go to the something fail what was what happened dude what didn't what it was one of it was one of those snake bit what what didn't go wrong one the boats handled like crap the 650s for sure (laughs) yeah well no and then i screwed something up yeah you know you know for he him and pops they were always on the cutting edge with everything like they really thunk outside the box bro okay and i saw that they had added some fiberglass to the back. It's hard to explain like where the back is, where the pump is. And it, it, they just added something. It was legal, but it looked cool and it made sense. Well, I told R&R about it. And they said, shit, Harry, we'll do whatever you think is going to work. So I had those things put on. Little did I know fish took them off two weeks later because it didn't handle right. <laughs> that boat did that thing wouldn't handle for shit, man. I, yeah. I was crashing all over the place. They were blowing up. And the worst thing that happened was that box van broke every other week in the middle of nowhere. Uh. And every bit of money, every it was so frustrating. Every bit of money that I would win, I would put into that van just to make it to the next race and be dead broke, frustrated, tired, covered with mosquito bites. See, these are all the stories that you think are so glamorous about jet skiers back in the day. Yeah. But that that, that year was just hell. So they they don't realize the behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to, you know, I had to drive all my own equipment, pay for everything. But when this thing, when this thing broke, bro, every week I had to pay for big old, tra- can you imagine a big box van with a big pro track trailer? How do you get that thing 58 miles somewhere to the nearest mom and pop shop. You got to pay a big old tow on them. Yeah, and you don't know anyone. I don't fucking, of course not. I'm in like somewhere Tennessee. I'm from Vegas, man. What do I know about this? Yeah. So uh, that was, you know, that was the season right there that was like, I put everything into it. It was my highest play. We did terrible. My, I was, I was broke. Absolutely broke. And I'm like, that's a wrap. Yep, done. Because the sit downs were coming. And we just went ahead and just, I, I just cut my losses, guys, right then, you know, uh, and just moved on. That makes me frustrated just to even think about that, about that year. It truly does. What, all right, what's your absolute best memory? When you think about, when you, you know, you close your eyes and you think, all right, what was the, was it a world finals? Was it one of the tour stops on the national tour? What's your, your favorite memory of your racing career? I got it. I got it right now. And of course, and this is going to be a two-parter. Go for it. Of course, Jeff was involved. Okay? Of course, Jeff was involved. It was 91 West Coast here. Okay? Now, it was the, there were two, two tours going on at the same time. The IJSBA, I think it was Budweiser. But then there was the Hot Water Tour going on at the same time. And it was, uh, let's just say we didn't have our frontline boats. But it was still, I believe uh, Jet Pilot put it on. So, but it was still all the pros doing all their best. Okay. Yeah. We're in St. Petersburg, Florida. One of my greatest places in the world because my dear friends, the Rendas, Joe Renda and his family live there. And it's an awesome piece of the world. It's very tropical. So, of course, Pro Modified Final Event is the finale of all weekend. And the film crews would, this great story, the film crews, would look at the weather. Sometimes they'd say the weather's coming in; it'll be bad. So let's run pro mod first thing. Yep. So they'd have good lighting. So we went ahead and did that. I take off and get a great start, and I'm I'm winning. I'm winning this bastard, and I'm riding great. The ski's handling good. I don't see Jeff nowhere. I am in my own zone. I'm two laps away from the checkered flag. 
I don't know where he came from. I don't even know how he did it. This dude shot so far wide. And when he dove in and passed me on a left-handed turn, at a buoy, it was like I was standing still. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. That's what Jeff did. Yeah. He was such a smart rider that he would pick and choose. He'd set you up, dog. He would set you up three laps ahead of time for a certain turn that he knew he could get you. Wow. Okay, that's what all great riders do. Yeah. So he passed me so fast that it, it pissed me off so bad. But this particular time, I caught him back two turns later, and I passed him. Oh, wow. That's and great. I won. Back and forth. Really? Fantastic. And I won. And I had such a bad season with West Coast. But on that particular day, at that particular time, I outrode him. So what was it like? I mean, obviously, it's a great, a great feeling to win the race. But Jeff wouldn't have been beaten that often. What, what was he like off the track? So once you'd won the race, you're obviously high-fiving people and you're happy and your, your mechanics and your holders are stoked. I got something so cool to say about Jeff, about this particular race. But let me tell you something. Jeff was all business. He wasn't a high five, hey, good luck kind of guy. So I was ecstatic. Everything, it, I was just elated through the win. And so you got to understand something. After that race, now we had to line up, you know, an hour later for Pro Superstock final event, right? Mm -hmm. Because Pro Modified went first. We still had to run the Pro Superstock final. I had won the big one. Let me tell you something about racing in Florida. When you're from the West Coast, when you're not used to the humidity, it will you can't breathe. Yeah. If you're not used to the humidity, it takes it all out of your body. Let me tell you something about Jeff Jacobs right now. He pushed his body so hard in that race to win. And it doesn't matter that it was number five he was passing. He pushed himself so hard that he went straight to the paramedics and had to get IVs. Wow. Okay, now watch this. Pro Superstock to the line. He's still in the paramedics. Mama Jacobs is down there with his Superstock trying to get it started. I'm over there with Mama trying to help her. Uh -huh. Thinking, why am I even starting this thing? Jeff's still in the paramedics with IVs in his arm. What? Yeah. Are, why am I? She gets it started. Jeff comes out of the paramedic, gets on his super stock, and beat the beat the tar out of us. <laughs> Classic Jeff. That's a true story. Would you ever expect something like that to happen? Was that guy not just you know incredible? Next level. Yeah. Yeah, he was. So you spoke about on one of our other conversations about each of them, you know, off the track. And do you want to tell us a little bit about Jeff's, you know, persona? Because he was all business, wasn't he? He sort of, he took everything pretty seriously. He was pretty polished in his interviews. Very much so. And um, great. I'm glad we're going to get on this Jeff subject because it's, let's just make something crystal clear. And then I'll get back into his demeanor. Jeff was the best rider with the best equipment. Yeah. Period. Okay. His equipment was, was far superior than ours in a lot of times, but a lot of times it was equal. But if you would have put me, Victor, or Fish on Jeff's equipment, on the PJS Pro Mod, would we have done better? Yes, we would have. But would we have accomplished what Jeff accomplished? I know I couldn't have done what Jeff did. That's how, that's how good he was. Now, getting back to his all business uh, at hand, you know, it all, stem, it all stems from Jeff's parents. You know, Bill, Bill Jacobs was the key to everything. You know, he knew just like Bill Gocher, my, my stepdaddy knew his boy had talent. Bill had the money to back it. He got with Ed Miller. They knew what they had in Jeff, and Jeff never disappointed him. Hmm. 
they went, he had all the right motorhomes. They went to Yuma, Arizona and set up custom tracks. And Jeff had everything given to him on a silver platter to be a champion. And Jeff performed. Yeah. What a legend. He, he was, he, he was, and is, will always be an absolute legend, absolute legend beyond. Now, once again, I mean, his, his equipment was superior, but he was just also that superior of a rider. You know, I just want to pay my respect where respect is due. And that's of no disrespect to Vic, Victor, me or fish. I mean, it's just my opinion. Jeff, Jeff was everything. Yeah. Let's say you had a microphone to me right now. Actually, you kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Harry, what were you thinking? What were you thinking at the championships in 92? Um, well, we want to be Jeff. Okay. Well, in 89, when you went to Oceanside, California, and you were thinking about whole shot, what were you thinking? Yeah, I was trying to beat Jeff. <laughs> and <laughs> that's just the way it was. Yeah. So I was thinking, been thinking a lot about riding styles, Jeff, Victor, me, and Fish. Then kids like, and I got such a funny one to say about Chris McCluggage and just hats off to what he's done in his career. But I'm going to make, <clears throat> I'm just going to make everybody fucking laugh. And Chris will love it too, because here's the, here's the, here, and I, Chris is a damn good friend of mine. Let me tell you the truth about Chris McCluggy. First time we saw this kid, the first time Harry Gocher ever saw this kid was in was in Florida, because he's from Naples, and we were at an event in Isla Morada, Key Isla Morada, one of the greatest places on earth, and it was an expert expert freestyle. The kid wasn't even. He was no one. But man, it was this little fat kid. <laughs> little chubby. <laughs> and when I say, I'm telling you, dude, when I say chubby, I mean, he was extremely chubby, short, thing. Yeah. Okay. But what I saw, <laughs> I'm telling you, bro. <clears throat> and, and what, I, but what I saw when he was doing three, he was doing pirouettes and, he was doing 360s and he was just jumping all over the place. And I'm thinking, my God, this little chubby kid has an extreme balance. But I'm tell I'm telling you that the, the the kid was a short chubby <laughs> fuck. Trust me, it gets a lot better. He had such balance that it really struck me as like, wow, you know, there's something with this little chubby thing. <laughs> but okay, so that was that. So we go into our off season, and that's four months you know, possibly at the longest, at the longest stretch. Yeah. And here comes Chris the very next season. And I don't know what kind of training regimen he went on and what he did, but he transformed his entire body. And this dude was a muscle bound stud. Well, I guess he's lost that puppy fat and he's now turning into a man. Oh, and it's like he, he did it just in like a short amount of time. And has done nothing but just wonderful things with his career. But what had happened was, see, he struggled with Yamaha because, you know, it was all Kawasaki. And then when Yamaha Superjet came in, you know, into the market, they they hooked up right off the bat. They hooked up really well. They they cornered weird, but they were slow, damn slow. And even when he jumped in with ProTech and he got a big ride with them, they were not competitive at all. And I just, it was the year I finally had that 650 with Tim Judge and I finally had some top end speed. And I remember going by, the, he just jumped, Chris just jumped way, way, like three boat lengths out. And I, I get on that 650 and I, I saw him and I punched in the top gear and I went by this guy like he was standing still. And I swear to goodness, I thought, wow. This is what Jeff has been feeling like his whole life, going by motherfuckers like they're standing still on, just just going straight to the first turn. But I just kind of touching on the Chris uh, deal a little bit. Um, so back to riding style. So so me and Jeff had a similar style. So riding a jet ski is a lot like you know your stance is like riding a skateboard or or a surfboard. Sure, sure. You're gonna be regular. Or you're gonna be goofy footed, left foot forward or right foot forward. Okay, so. Jeff, Jeff's left foot forward and the left turn, I always call that, you know, that's our, uh, that's what I call mine. You know, that's our attack turn. 
And that's when you put your butt down if you have to, and you, you do a butt turn to your left-hand side. That is our most comfortable turn as a regular footer going to the left side. Because a, a, a leg drag or a butt drag is nothing more than putting a, a rudder on the water and stabilizing your turn. That's what it is. Yeah, sure. So, you know, if you were to put a left-handed, if you were to put a leg drag to the left side, you have a rudder on the left. Yeah, absolutely. Meaning that you're going to be more stable and you can just pin it, pin it wide open. Okay. So getting back to it. So Jeff and I had that on the left-hand side, full throttle. Now the right-handed turns for riders like Jeff and I, they were a little more delicate. Yeah, I can see you sort of, you're on your toes and you're... You're on your toes. Yeah, it's more of a finesse. We can't just go bang in into that right turn, okay? Now, of course, Jeff's a champ. You know, he was awesome at both of them. He was phenomenal on his rights, but I'm sure he'd tell you the same thing. If, if we had to do it all over again, Jeff and I, we'd just do NASCAR, a bunch of left-hand turns. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, now... Here comes Victor. So, and before I get in, because I can just say so much, but I guess I'll just start with this. So, Victor, Victor struggled with horsepower too. He had good equipment, he had pretty equipment, and they were reliable equipment. And Butch's was behind Victor as much as R and R was behind me. I can't tell you. And if I could, it would be maybe three or four times this quote. Oh, there goes Victor again. Long shot to the first turn and Victor's gone. No, his equipment wasn't that. His equipment was not that way. Victor had to work hard for every win that he got. He was very fit too. Oh, he's in incredible shape. He was cardiovascular to the max. You know, he was a far more dedicated athlete than I was when it came, when it come to preparation, he was, he was extremely fit. Victor getting tired. Just it, it's not even in the realm of a possibility. Okay. So back to Victor's riding style. So Jeff and I would butt turn to the right, have a rudder. Well, Victor was goofy footed. Yeah. So Victor had a rudder to the right. Then he leg dragged to the left. Yeah. True. He had them both. He would get straight on the gas only let off when he had to. So he's making all those bumper centers and, and getting those speeds up and up and up, but didn't have the, the top end speed, so he's got to make up that, that time on the corners. That's exactly correct. And that's, that, that's the same way that I made up my time, you know, was in the corners. But Victor had, Victor had that advantage, that little bit of an advantage that propelled him to do what he did. And I want the record to state right now, Victor worked for every W he ever got. He yeah. worked for it. He worked his ass off for it. And, and once again, never to take one thing ever away from Jeff, and, and I never will, but <sighs> Victor was under horsepower, dude. So anytime that he beat him or he beat anybody else, once again, dude, you know, he worked hard. But really, weren't you, weren't you all under horsepower? I mean, you've all got pretty amazing modified skis. Compared to Jeff, absolutely. So, you know, Cameron, you know, ask me what I was thinking before the championships in 92. So, Harry, what were you thinking for the championships in '92? Well, when you went to the uh, Bush World Cup and when you went to the Bush World Cup in '89, that's a per certain race. What were you thinking then? And what do you think? Okay. Man, I went to that race just to be Jeff. Okay, but when you went over here, what were you thinking? Just to be Jeff. And no matter where we went, he was the pinnacle. No, fucking for real. I mean, he was everything. Everything we prepared for. Um, not to ever take anything away. Hey. I hope I beat, you know, Fish this race because Fish is, you know, my next subject to discuss or Victor or, you know, Mac when he was coming up. But, you know, Jeff, Jeff was it. We wanted to make that pipe better so we can beat Jeff. We wanted to tread that mountain just so we can beat Jeff. And what time, what place, what event it was. Could PJS ever sponsor anyone else? Or was there only ever like a one, one person they could sponsor at a time? I was just wondering if there was any you know, inside information that they yeah. were considering. No, I do. I do have insight on that. Okay, so 80, let's say, okay, well, make no mistake, Larry Rippenkroger was the premier rider. And that's in 85, 86, something like the 87. He was the premier rider. But about that time, 85, 86, 87, 
they did have some other riders by the name of Pat Helfrich. Um, Mike Castrucci, number six. Mike Castrucci actually went to the World Championships and I'm guessing 85, 86, and won on some PJS equipment, okay? But once Jeff matured, there was no need for nothing else. Yeah, because Reagan Cole was a, a sponsored female rider too, wasn't she, for PJs? Yeah. Now, yeah. Reagan Cole was an awesome individual, and I'm going to tell you something about Reagan not a lot of people know. Reagan Cole was an Olympian. Really? What was her sport? In bench press. Huh. Yeah, I mean, she was she had a body on her, and 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 she treated her body like that. So Reagan Cole was just an a, in, incredible athlete. Yeah, good shape. Oh God, understatement, brother. Now, did she have PJS on the side of her ski? Yeah, you bet. How much support they actually did? Now, her husband, Reagan's husband, uh, he was financially wealthy. He, you know, he had a lot of money. Good support. Great guy. Um, support of Reagan to the end. Um, but how much they did for her, I'll just put it to you like this. When it was world championship time at the race, it was the PJS 10. There was just number one boats. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. There was just Jeff boats. So that's the heart and soul of PJS. And I mean, can you blame them? Look what they did, right? Yeah. Hey, I've actually got another question about his engines actually, or what, yourself, Victor, and Chris all thought when you saw under the hood, or if you even got a peek under the hood of that electronic fuel injection system, because I believe Victor had one and also Jeff had one in the 91, 92 season. Uh, okay. So you weren't going to get 50 yards near the tent. Ah, yeah. All very secret. Oh my God. When, when they, when they did that and they worked on that, that off season, the only thing rumors were was something big is going down and something big. And they got a whole other department in PJS that nobody's allowed in. These guys were so secretive about the things that they did. Uh, did I ever see inside that motor? Nope. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Like as in, it's kind of like these days with Formula One or NASCAR or any of the the, I guess it's the same with motocross as well. They they want to keep it all a secret what their modifications are for the next year. MotoGP, it's the same deal. Oh, you know, they're covering things. You know, they would cover things up. And, and, and I'll jump back several years. Uh, Larry Rippenkroger back in the day, they PGS made uh, a nozzle that was adjustable. It went down, you know, for hole shots that would keep the nose Oh, yeah, drop nozzle. Yeah. Now, they were the first to do that, and they did that with Rippenkroger, and he had a clutch on the left side. Now, of course, everybody knows jet skis just have a throttle on the right. We don't have a clutch. We don't have a transmission. Well, he had this clutch, and everybody's like, what the hell? And we're like, here they go again, and it was the <laughs> nozzle. So when they lifted it out of the water, the first thing somebody did was put a towel over the back of it. <laughs> yeah, they were serious, bro. So what about your engine setups through LNS, West Coast, r and What was one of your favorite engine mods that your mechanics did that you're like, wow, this actually makes it go quicker? Was it just, was it just the tuning or was there anything in particular that you can go, wow, that, that actually gave me a lot of performance? I got three things offhand. One was the 650 that Tim Judge built for me yep. when he put that motor in there. And the way it hooked up, that that is just always going to be tip top on my list. Like I say, when I got on that thing, I said, oh, my Lord, here we go. We got something special here. Yeah. The second was, I think it was 90. I believe we got a pump from Bill Chapin, a pump housing. Okay, one of those PJS afterburner ones? or I don't know, dude. I'm going back several years. I don't think there was a name for it, brother. I don't know if it was a, a prototype scat track stainless. Or whatever it was, but see, Bill, Bill was always cutting edge, and what little I know about um, the here and now, let's say he, you know, he still is, right? But he gave us a pump one year, and it was just a pump, and it it, it really changed a lot for me. I'm like, oh my god, now wonder, Victor, now wonder he, he hooks up because Victor would always be hooked up, man, even in the chop. You know, we're, we're free will and he, whoa, 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 and he was just going by us. 
so there was a pump that that really that really strikes my my brain um and the last one and this was my last season i retired one season i was called back by greater yamaha um to ride on the sit downs and there was a shop out of phoenix i think the guy's name was dan great guy very religious man hard working name of his company was engine tricks okay and they had contracted him and damn dude this was one of the strongest motors i'd ever been on it was just incredible it was power from boom to end it was it never stopped that was a great engine it, you know we did well with it you know that's cool i would be remiss if i didn't talk about fashetti's riding style and i'm going to tell you something when i told you this guy's a surfer I guarantee you he still surfs. When he gets his jet ski in, in the surf just to go practice, he's not riding it. He just plays with it. He'll get up. And he'll just do, does things. But his riding style will never be mimicked because it can't be. Yeah. Fish was so in shape. He was so in shape and so strong. But he just had – he put every bit of his whole body into every turn. And that's the best way that I can – like nobody could ever and ever will ride like him. He was just, he just put every bit of his being into the left and every bit of his being into the right. That's what everybody loved about it. Cause everybody was so committed. Like all of you guys, it was just such a physical sport and everybody that rides them knows that it's not easy so that it's not easy to go fast. And when it, you know, if you nail one corner, that's amazing. But you guys were putting corner after corner, lap after lap, race after race, you know, year after year. It was so cool. What would you give as the best piece of advice to ride the vintage skis or, or you know, the 550s? Well, the first thing I would say was find your comfort zone, whether you're going to ride left-footed or right-footed. Now, I'm not going to give anybody any advice on the sport class or the sit-down class because that's not my specialty. I'm talking about a stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me tell you what I did one year was once you find that you're talented on it and you're first, you better find if you want to race it, you better find out if you're good on it. And if you think if you think you're good, go to another state and check them out. Yeah. I was really, you know, I was really good. I was one of the best at a very young age in Lake Mead, but California was where it's at. That's true. You know, back in the day. So if you think you're good, travel yeah, travel travel to some other states and get into some national events and see if you're competitive. Now fitness is everything. Fitness is everything, cardiovascular, upper and lower strength. Now, one season, I went ahead and did a bunch of laps, and I was, you know, way focused on getting my body exactly in, in more tip top. And I, I'd burn a bunch of laps, and I'd just stand straight up, and I'd say, what hurts? What hurts bad? Well, my tricep hurts, my right quad hurts, and, and I'd work that muscle. I would specifically go and work those muscles. Smart. And and there, there's not. There's nothing like, there's nothing like cycling, and, and mountain biking. You know, rollerblading's kind of out. We rollerbladed a lot, but I mean, you can go, you can go right now as we speak today. Jeff's a professional mountain biker. Uh, D D L Wood, he was a top, he was a top expert rider. But this guy was the pillar of fitness, bro. Mm. I mean, this guy had a body like hell. And now he's a professional mountain bike rider. So cross training, cross training is big. You want to ride as much as you can, train the muscles that are sore. But man, get on, get on the bike. We we, we rode bikes like crazy, and we still are. That's awesome. So get fit, train hard, find out at, after a good session, find out what hurts, and then train that muscle to get to make sure you can um, become stronger or have better endurance. Some good advice. Yeah, you know, if your biceps are hurting. And, and the one thing about jet skiing, too, it's so much similar to motocross is, your, is you get an arm pump Yeah. on a, on a, probably just about even even a sit down, a stand up or whatever. I mean, arm pump is <laughs> pro motocrossers go through that stuff. I mean, after after I was done jet skiing, you know, I got on a, I got on a motocross bike and, you know, did pretty well. I had, a, I had a really good time riding motocross, but I'm like, damn, my hands are just killing me. So if it's something that you want to do and try to make a living out or have fun or be competitive, eh, you better get your hands in shape. You better be able to bend iron, brother. I'll tell you that because that sucker is going to wear you out. Yeah. Oh, mate. Look, we've covered so much ground from races to characters and, you know, your competitors to engine mods, handling everything from your sponsors, the good times, the bad times. We've had a 
pretty good coverage of, of a flashback to the glory years. It's been awesome. Yeah, they certainly were. No, that's wonderful. I appreciate you having me, Cam. I absolutely loved my chat with Harry, and I hope you did too. What did you make of his decision to retire? It's amazing to hear him reflect on the season that led up to it all these years later. And how funny was his memory of an early Chris McCluggage, going from a chubby little kid to a muscle-bound stud. We could have continued our conversation for hours. He just has so many amazing stories and a hilarious way of telling them that I could have listened to all day. I don't know about you, but I learned so much. I'm so glad Harry chose to share his journey with us. Before we say goodbye though, let's have a quick dive into what you guys have said after part one of Harry's interview. Brian said this, Gotta say, I can't wait to hear part two of Paul and Harry's interview. So glad to see him come out of his shell after so long. I lived and raced in that era too and was sitting there with a big smile on my face and was nodding along as he went through his progression. Well, Brian, we're sure you had that smile on your face through the rest of our chat with Harry. He really was on fire, wasn't he? Also, Mickey got in touch to say this. The podcast was awesome, mate. I can't wait to hear the next episode. I've always wondered about the rise and fall of R&R and was hoping Harry would touch on it. It's so awesome these stories are getting recorded before they get lost in time. Mate, we think so too. Thanks for getting in touch with us, Mika, and don't worry, we'll be keeping them coming. And finally, Benji says this. Listen to my very first podcast this morning on vintage jet ski with Hall and Harry Gocha on my way to work. Part one was really cool to hear how he got started with his stepdad. I can't wait for part two. It was great hearing him talk about signing autographs and him being just blown away. Well, I can tell you, I have an autograph from Harry and all the guys, and I was blown away just standing there in the lines and being that close to them. They were like damn rock stars. <laughs> well, Benji, we're so happy to be able to bring you your first podcast experience. And how incredibly humble is Harry? I'm sure Harry's stories will bring a little extra meaning to that autograph all these years later. Well, legends, that's a wrap. I'm sorry if we didn't get to read your message out this time, but please keep them coming as we read each and every one of them. If you want to hit us up, you can email us at podcast at Vintage Jet Ski or you can reach us on Instagram at Vintage Jet Ski. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show and if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, we're on Apple, Google, Spotify and all of your favourite podcast apps and subscribing is the best way to ensure you never miss a beat. So until next time, ride by day and wrench by night.